In the midst of tension and anger, Roman fixed Henry with a hard stare, demanding an explanation for his presence. It was a confrontation fraught with the unspoken understanding that Roman would not take kindly to any ulterior motives. In Henry's mind, the possibility of revealing his true purpose, getting close to Roman, loomed like an impending dismissal. Nevertheless, Henry opted for a different approach. With a deep breath, Henry acknowledged his prior mistake and offered a sincere apology. Yet, he quickly pivoted to pledge his loyalty to Roman, emphasizing his commitment as a nobleman from Cairo. In a display of deference, Henry bowed, articulating that, like Roman, he couldn't remain passive in the unfolding events. Roman, wearing a serious expression, granted Henry permission to follow but issued a stern warning. Any interference with Roman's plans would not be tolerated. As the uneasy duo, with Kobe leading, made their way towards the southern front through the mountain route, they stumbled upon an injured soldier from the southern training camp. Concern etched across Roman's face, he sought details about the attack. The soldier, visibly shaken, revealed that the training camp had been assaulted. Roman's sharp mind deduced that it was the rear, not the front line, that had faced the brunt of the attack. Soldiers from the training center, fleeing to their current location, hinted that the attack had occurred approximately 30 minutes ago. The Kingdom of Hector, it seemed, was employing a strategic onslaught against Cairo's five lines of defense, utilizing a fast-moving unit to orchestrate a synchronized assault. The realization hit Roman like a lightning bolt. In a decisive moment, he ordered his soldiers to divert immediately to the southern training camp. The urgency in his command underscored the gravity of the situation. The scene transitioned seamlessly to the beleaguered southern training camp. Amidst the chaos, two Hector soldiers found amusement in tormenting MacBurney. Anger ignited in MacBurney's eyes as he demanded an end to the mockery. Unfazed, he declared his unwavering resolve to face any challenge head on, vowing to risk his life to eliminate even one Hector soldier. MacBurney, undeterred by the odds, beckoned the Hector soldiers to confront him. Yet, amidst this tumult, MacBurney's thoughts strayed to his missing right arm. A pang of longing for the strength he once possessed surged through him. His mind also echoed with questions about Roman's whereabouts. In the chaos of the southern front, where tension gripped everyone, Roman stood out as the only one who hadn't let go. Roman, designated to the fifth line of defense, was conspicuously absent. MacBurney, grappling with the unfolding crisis, couldn't shake off the feeling that Roman's presence was crucial, especially in maintaining the much-needed composure. MacBurney's thoughts raised as he faced the imminent threat of death. In the chaotic whirlwind of combat, one name echoed in his mind, Sir Roman. MacBurney couldn't help but wonder why Sir Roman hadn't taken action yet. It was a moment of reflection that hinted at MacBurney's detachment from the battlefield, a realization that perhaps his own fate was drawing near. As the tension mounted, a sudden shattering of the wall behind the Hector soldiers shifted the dynamics of the battlefield. To the surprise of the Hector soldiers, there stood Roman Dimitri, a formidable figure radiating an air of command. Roman's presence provided a glimmer of hope in the dire situation. Glancing to the side, Roman locked eyes with MacBurney, who, against the odds, was still standing. Swiftly assessing the situation, Chris, a trusted ally of Roman, issued a decisive command to the soldiers. They were to wipe out the enemy soldiers and rescue any survivors. The atmosphere on the battlefield shifted as Roman and his forces unleashed their full might in response to Chris's orders. Amidst the fray, a few Hector soldiers, undeterred by the overwhelming force against them, made a desperate attempt to attack Roman. In a calculated move, Roman employed a special technique, surrounded by a mysterious purple aura. The technique had a paralyzing effect, freezing the Hector soldiers in their tracks. Roman's intention was clear. He sought to capture these soldiers alive, an approach that spoke volumes about his strategic mindset on the battlefield. As the paralyzed soldiers lay immobilized, Roman knew their incapacity would buy precious time. However, one resilient Hector soldier, driven by the instinct to escape, attempted to flee. MacBurney, showing remarkable resilience despite his earlier brushes with mortality, swiftly intercepted the escaping soldier. In a display of combat prowess, MacBurney subdued the soldier, putting them in a headlock and swiftly bringing them down. Acknowledging MacBurney's efforts, Roman approached him, expressing gratitude for a job well done. He encouraged MacBurney to take a break, recognizing the toll the intense battle had taken on him. As MacBurney succumbed to exhaustion and passed out, Roman took charge of the remaining tasks, ensuring the safety of the survivors and the containment of the Hector soldiers. With the immediate threats neutralized, Chris reported back to Roman. The outcome was a success. 
12 Hector soldiers were eliminated, and 5 survivors were rescued. According to the survivors' accounts, Vale, a prominent figure among the Hector forces, had fled to the mountains, nursing injuries from the fierce engagement. In the aftermath of the battle, Roman's thoughts delved into the strategic implications of Hector's actions. He speculated that the assault on the southern training camp might have been a diversion, a prelude to their larger plans. The Hector soldiers they faced were only a fraction of the main unit numbering in the several hundreds. Roman questioned Chris about the captured soldiers and, with a stern directive, allowed only Chris access to the building where they were held captive. Roman, now focused on unraveling the mysteries behind Hector's actions, entered the building with a sense of purpose. He believed there must be a deeper reason for Hector to resort to the strategies outlined in the sacred book. Facing the captive soldiers, Roman set the ominous tone by offering them a slim chance for a painless end. They had three minutes to provide the answers he sought. Otherwise, they would endure unimaginable pain until their demise. A defiant soldier challenged Roman, goading him to end their lives immediately. Unfazed, Roman initiated the interrogation with a simple yet crucial question. What was the goal of the kingdom of Hector? The soldier, instead of answering, met the inquiry with a defiant smile. Unperturbed, Roman pressed on with a second question. Why did the Hector soldiers attack the southern training camp? The soldier's silence persisted, and Roman declared that their three minutes were up. With the same mysterious technique emanating a purple aura, Roman touched the soldier's shoulder, eliciting anguished screams. Roman detailed the pain as muscle splitting and bones fracturing, emphasizing the inevitable approach of death. In the face of excruciating torment, Roman acknowledged the soldier's likely training to withstand torture. However, he asserted that divulging information wouldn't alter the outcome of Hector's operation. One soldier, boldly resigned to their fate, claimed it was too late to stop Hector's plan, even if they cooperated. Roman, with a sinister expression, revealed the truth. He never sought the soldiers' genuine answers. Instead, he orchestrated the encounter to observe their reactions. With a victorious guess, Roman unveiled that the true purpose of the meeting was the rear. The revelation sent shockwaves through the captive soldier. Roman, taking advantage of the moment, swiftly subdued the soldier. Roman contemplated the broader implications of Hector's cunning tactics. Reflecting on the situation, Roman discerned that the simultaneous attack on the southern front had been a diversion. The realization struck him with the gravity of the broader conflict. If Hector's operation succeeded, the southern front, a vital strategic position, would be on the brink of destruction. The narrative transitions to a room where Roman directs MacBurney to provide a detailed account of the events at the southern training camp. MacBurney begins by revealing that the kingdom of Hector initiated an attack just two hours prior. Engaged in his routine preparations for the upcoming rider's training, MacBurney was caught off guard when Hector's soldiers, seemingly out of nowhere, launched a sudden assault on the southern training camp. In response to the surprise attack, MacBurney and his comrades swiftly mobilized troops, attempting to counter the intrusion. However, the disparity in power proved overwhelming, resulting in the brutal slaughter of the southern camp's forces. Amidst the chaos, uncertainty loomed regarding the fate of Bale, the commander of the training camp, adding another layer of concern to the unfolding situation. Roman, seeking strategic insights, turns his attention to the specifics of the enemy's armor. He questions MacBurney about any distinctive features he noticed. MacBurney recounts that Hector's soldiers were lightly armed, and the individual who appeared to be the enemy commander bore a face covered in scars. Roman, drawing connections from his knowledge, suggests that these soldiers might be the renowned rangers of Hector's kingdom. MacBurney, taken aback by this revelation, recognizes the leader of the rangers as a decorated veteran with scars earned in numerous wars, emblematic of his experience and prowess on the battlefield. However, the motive behind Hector's audacious attack on the southern training camp remains elusive, prompting MacBurney to express his confusion. He questions why Hector, with a clear advantage, wouldn't direct their forces to topple the front line instead of targeting the training camp. Furthermore, MacBurney is perplexed by the fact that Hector's soldiers, instead of pressing forward, chose to retreat after the assault. In response, Roman provides a crucial piece of the puzzle. Roman explains that the camp, situated on the way to the rear position, left Hector with no choice but to attack it. This insight offers a new perspective for MacBurney who begins to grasp the intricacies of the situation. However, it also raises more questions, and MacBurney, still in the dark about Hector's true intentions, seeks further clarification. Roman, sensing the need to reveal the hidden truth, 
discloses that Hector's attack on the front line was merely a deceptive maneuver. The real objective was to secure the rear position, which, to MacBurney's astonishment, housed a warp gate. In a moment of realization, MacBurney understands the gravity of the situation. A warp gate, Roman explains, is a magical crystal that manipulates space, allowing for instantaneous travel. Beyond obstructing enemy reinforcements, possessing warp gates on the battlefield has evolved into a crucial strategic advantage, as now Hector have the capability to reset the coordinates of the warp gate under their control. This extraordinary ability enables them to execute a reverse attack, making the warp gate a formidable asset. However, to counter any potential threats, the warp gate is equipped with a self-destruct device, a testament to the intricate and high-stakes nature of the ongoing conflict. Roman, the key strategist in this narrative, reveals to MacBurney the depth of Hector's commitment to victory. The kingdom has devised a must-win strategy, one that hinges on successfully securing the warp gate located in the rear. This tactical move is considered paramount, with the assurance that victory will be within their grasp if executed effectively. Upon learning of this critical strategy, MacBurney, ever the practical thinker, suggests that they should move swiftly to assist the rear troops. However, Rome encounters this instinct, questioning whether MacBurney has received any requests for assistance from the rear. The revelation that Hector's Ranger unit, a formidable force, left the southern training camp an hour and a half ago leaves little room for optimism. Roman asserts that, by now, the warp gate may have already fallen into the hands of the enemy, effectively isolating all forces on the southern front. This revelation underscores the dire circumstances that Roman and his companions now find themselves in. As the realization sinks in that they won't have the kingdom's support from this point forward, Roman emphasizes the need for survival. The stakes are higher than ever for Roman and his companions. The narrative then transitions to the Hector border, where Edwin, a key figure on the opposing side, stands before the warp gate. The scene provides a glimpse into the calculated moves of Hector's forces. A soldier delivers a report to Edwin, detailing the progress of Hector soldiers as they approach the rear of Cairo, passing through the southern training camp. The kingdom of Cairo, unaware of Hector's strategic maneuvers, is engrossed in defending their line. Edwin, demonstrating a keen understanding of the psychological aspects of warfare, cautions against complacency. He orders the soldiers to persist in their attacks on Cairo's defensive position, emphasizing the need to wear down the opponent's resolve. Edwin's strategic acumen comes to the forefront as he reveals the central importance of the existing wall in front of Hector. Success in the ongoing operation is contingent on preserving this crucial barrier. In a reflective moment, Edwin acknowledges the past infiltrations of Jackson's Ranger unit into the southern front. While he contemplates the potential for a swift victory if Hector had initiated a full-scale attack on the southern front from the beginning, but the most important thing for Hector now is the existence of the warp gate. Edwin issues a stark directive to the soldiers under his command. Contingent on a worst-case scenario, he instructs them to be prepared to destroy the warp gate, a potent asset that could turn the tide of battle. Edwin's mind, ever calculating, envisions the potential failure of the operation and the dire consequences of Hector resorting to the destruction of the warp gate, triggering the initiation of the second phase of their strategic plan. This decision is not taken lightly, and a soldier observing Edwin's rational yet harsh judgment contemplates the gravity of the man known as the Cald of Hector. Edwin Hector's presence carries weight, embodying the resurgence and revitalization of the Hector's kingdom in the face of challenging circumstances. The narrative then shifts to the rear end of Cairo, where Hector's soldiers are actively engaged in an attack. The commander of the Hector Rangers, recognizing the urgency of the situation, declares that the time for war has arrived. Their primary objective is clear, to establish a connection without alerting the enemy to the existence of the warp gate. The success of this mission holds the key to Hector's strategic advantage and potential victory. The story takes a temporal leap to a year ago, unveiling a pivotal conversation between Edwin and Jackson, the commander of the Rangers. Edwin, acknowledging the kingdom of Hector's vulnerability, highlights the escalating pressure from Golden Bank and the looming threat of a depleted national treasury due to recurring poor harvests. In a move that underscores the desperation of Hector's predicament, Edwin proposes a partnership to Jackson. He suggests that Jackson takes charge of the southern front of the Kingdom of Cairo alongside Edwin. The urgency of this proposal is heightened by rumors that Hector's ongoing poor harvests have invoked the wrath of the gods, casting a shadow over the kingdom's fate. Edwin, recognized as a genius in Hector's history, understands the chaotic age they find themselves in. 
In a twist of fate, he believes that a hero must rise to meet the challenges that this tumultuous era presents. Within a remarkably short span of time, Hector's forces undertake a meticulous series of actions. They scout the southern front 48 times, employing spies to dig tunnels in the rear positions. The ranger unit, with strategic precision, infiltrates the completed tunnels, gaining access to the coveted warp gate. Returning to the present, the culmination of these efforts materializes as Jackson and his soldiers successfully establish a connection with the warp gate. Through the swirling portal emerges Prince Edwin, a key player in the unfolding drama. Edwin, with strategic foresight, allocates responsibilities. He leaves the 1st Battalion in the capable hands of Killian, instructing him to handle the remnants of the rear positions and fortify defenses in anticipation of support from the Kingdom of Cairo. However, amid this moment of strategic clarity, a note of uncertainty creeps in. Edwin approaches Jackson, revealing a concerning development, the loss of contact with Baron McCleary, who held a critical role in charge of the 5th line of defense. Edwin turned to Jackson, questioning his knowledge of the unfolding situation. Jackson, the commander in Edwin's ranks, informed Edwin that his soldiers were currently in the process of verifying the facts. Trying to allay Edwin's concerns, Jackson assured him that the situation only pertained to the fifth line of defense and not to any critical areas. In his assessment, Jackson speculated that the fifth defense line, known for its historical challenges, might succumb to an attack with just a few troops. Edwin acknowledged that he would have instructed Jackson to proceed with the attack regardless of the circumstances. Jackson agreed, understanding the gravity of the directive. However, Edwin revealed a stern resolution. He asserted that once the operation concluded, regardless of Baron McCleary's performance, consequences awaited. Despite Edwin's meticulous planning, he had failed to account for two unforeseen variables. The complexity of the situation became apparent as they navigated through the intricacies of the evolving battlefield. The narrative then shifted to the first line of defense in Cairo, where soldiers conveyed a message to Count Donald, the commander in charge. They had received a call from the southern training camp. Count Donald promptly attended to the call, finding Roman from the fifth line of defense on the other end. Roman, getting straight to the point, shared critical information. It seemed that the Kingdom of Hector was employing a smokescreen strategy to capture the warp gate in the rear position. In anticipation of being isolated by enemy forces from both the front and back, they made the strategic decision to abandon the castle and retreat to the mountains. Roman emphasized the urgency of gathering all remaining forces on the mountain. Count Donald, considering the challenging terrain of the southern mountains, expressed concern about the difficulty of the task. Nevertheless, he assured Roman that he would personally assess the situation and then ended the call. Roman pondered the implications of this decision, realizing that, in this scenario, all defense lines except the fifth will be discarded. Roman swiftly directed the soldiers to pack their belongings as they are heading to the mountains. The narrative pivots to the first defense line in Cairo, where Donald, the commander, grapples with the challenge of connecting to the rear camp. Despite his attempts, he finds it difficult to establish communication. Recalling Roman's earlier caution, Donald acknowledges that even with troops sent from the southern front and nearby areas, it would take an estimated month for them to arrive. Frustration mounts as he contemplates whether there might be an alternative solution to their predicament. It occurs to him that if he can hold out in the fortress until reinforcements arrive, there's a chance they can turn the tide in their favor. Fast forward four hours, and Donald is taken aback to discover that they are now completely isolated. Hector's forces, seizing Cairo's warp gate and sending additional troops, have effectively cut off their defense lines both in the front and rear. Despite the dire circumstances, Donald regains composure and notes that his soldiers have expertly repaired the fortress walls. Armaments are meticulously prepared, a lesson learned from the errors of their initial battle. With these preparations, Donald believes they can endure the siege within the fortress and orders his soldiers to brace for an impending attack. In a briefing to the first defense troops, Donald delivers the sobering news that Hector has taken control of the warp gate, leaving them entirely cut off with no hope of reinforcement from the kingdom. However, drawing from their strategy in the first battle, Donald instills hope, emphasizing their commitment to enduring until reinforcements arrive. To their astonishment, as they launch their counterattack, they realize that Hector has a weapon flare in their possession. Hector initiates the use of the flare, effectively breaching the fortress walls in a matter of moments. In the ensuing chaos, Donald and his soldiers find themselves swiftly overwhelmed. In that critical instant, Donald's mind revisits Roman's cautionary words, 
realizing the validity of Roman Dimitri's foresight. Swiftly thereafter, Edwin executes a decisive strike, triumphantly overthrowing Count Donald and seizing command of the southern front line. Edwin, reflecting on the advantage gained by using the flare to initiate the attack, acknowledges that they were able to occupy the fortress with minimal losses. From Edwin's perspective, Hector is positioned to seamlessly conquer the entire southern front. He concludes that time is working in Hector's favor in this unfolding conflict. Edwin commands his soldiers to secure all surrendered foes in a designated area, aiming to prevent any unexpected threats to Hector. The objective is to amass as much ammunition as possible for negotiations with Cairo. Jackson approves of the plan, and Edwin initially deems it flawless. However, a sense of unease begins to gnaw at him as he considers potential oversights. The calm is shattered by a soldier delivering distressing news. Baron MacLeary has fallen on the battlefield, disrupting communication channels. Edwin, now wearing a grave expression, presses the soldier for details and demands the immediate presence of the individual who provided this information.